Ruck. And as I mentioned, uh, Carl's one of the group of scholars who came up with the widely used now term entheogen for the use of psychoactive substances in religion. So he's kind of a grandfather of this mod modern area of study. He's worked with people like R. Gordon Wasson, Albert Hoffman, and he's uh, enabled the uh, study of cannabis and ancient Greece and uh, the Judaic religion around the world uh, uh, it, to enter a new area in the academic world of acceptance and has uh, legitimized uh, an area that had been limited to the counterculture before that. And so uh, up next here we have Professor Carl Ruck, a classic of classics. Thank you. I must say it's a daunting task to follow after all the wonderful speeches you've heard, presentations you've heard today. And I have endeavored to make my talk very short because I anticipate that, um, you'll uh, want to ask questions. And I also hope that the other speakers want to join me perhaps in a panel discussion with you. So um, Inevitably, some of the things I'm saying have been handled already by the, the previous speakers. But uh, the task was to talk about cannabis. I'm going to expose the joke about a very famous scene from an ancient Greek comedy. It is the parody of Socrates, high above clouds of cannabis smoke. And it is going to implicate the great Spartan army in pot smoking as a ritual induction into their fearsome brotherhood of warriors in the court trial, when Socrates defended himself against the politically motivated indictment for impiety, Plato has the great philosopher trace the general prejudice against him back to this hilarious portrayal in the theater of Dionysus. The precise accusation was carefully worded to mask its real purpose, which was that Socrates stood accused of sympathizing with the arist <coughs> aristocratic Spartan elite. I want to prepare, however, for this expose by a quick overview of mankind's fascination, fascination with mind-altering drugs, particularly with regard to their role in religion and shamanism, where they are more properly termed entheogens. This is appropriate, since the purpose of this conference is to stimulate discussion about the current drug war and the denial of access to psychoactive substances employed as religious sacraments. The recently discovered Chauvet Cave, 1994, in southern France contains paintings and other evidence of religious use dating back to the Paleolithic period, some 32,000 years uh, ago, before the present time, the new termination BT. <coughs> BPT, and uh, left undisturbed for the past 25,000 years when the site was sealed until the present day by a landslide. The German filmmaker, Werner Herzog, was allowed exclusive access to document it in his recent, 2010, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. The evidence of ritual shamanism has led him to posit that the human species might better be named Homo Spiritualis. <coughs> named Homo Spiritualis rather than a simple tool maker known as Sapiens Sapiens. That is to say, uh, we perhaps have even misunderstood the very evolution of our own species. And so the beginning of our religious experience um, was what brought us to our present state as the species that dominates this planet. It was the sudden awakening of consciousness occasioned by psychoactive sacraments or entheogens that set mankind upon the path of evolutionary dominance over the other creatures of planet Earth. Entheogens were the very origin of religion. The caves served various scenarios as places of initiation and as the loci for the reciting of the most secret tales of the tribe's mythical origins. The paintings were both an evocation of the world outside and as permeable barriers affording access through to the different dimensions glimpsed in the shamanic trances, often empowered 
by the best of familiars depicted. Common in the drawings are the theme of the vulva as the gateway to another dimension and the theme of the psychostasis or the balance scale for determining the worthiness of the soul for the journey into the other world. Most people know this as an Egyptian motif, but the Greek vase indicates that the Greeks had the same idea. The caves are the womb-like structures. <coughs> the, the caves as womb-like structures were linked with upright stones outside, both natural and artificially modified, representing the intruding male member either as phallic dolmens or anthropomorphized as standing menhirs. The menhirs are the ones that are made into people. Sometimes these stones are clearly identifiable as mushrooms, indicating the clear involvement of entheogens in the spiritual transport induced in the cave enclosures. The phallic pillars and the caves are two aspects of the same experience. Some sites even depict humans with the attributes of sacred spiritual plants. This uh, rock face painting for Villar de Humo, de Humo, on the lower right hand side, you see dancing mushrooms, people, anthropomor uh, uh, zoomorphized into mushrooms. The journey of the soul passed along the axis established by the volcano, either down to the netherworld or up to the fiery surround of the cosmos known as the Empyrean via the alchemical forge of its burning caldera at its base. All fires leap All fires leap upward, converging at the ultimate limit which is the fiery surround of the cosmos. This becomes the final corporate accumulating totality of all consciousness and gnosis. Thus, the cultural founder of the tribe was often the thief who stole fire from the gods. It's more than that, however. This fire was emblematic of spiritual transmutation and was found resident in the psychoactive plants that were the substance of the Eucharist sacrament. Uh, we've lost it. Can you help me? use of the narthex to designate, <clears throat> thus, thus Prometheus, is who is the best known of these fire thieves, stole fire in a manner that is clearly identifiable in classical Greek tradition as the motif of the special procedures involved in the gathering of magical plants. He placed the fire stolen from the gods in a narthex. This was a hollow stem of a giant reed container thereafter employed symbolically by the herbalists in harvesting medicinal and sacred plants. It is blatantly named as the receptacle for narcotics. The word was adopted as the title for several encyclopedias of drugs. The use of narthex to designate the vestibule of Christian churches indicates the longevity of the metaphor that sacred space is accessed through the medicine cabinet quite obvious. This gateway sometimes was ornamented with the pagan goddess above, spreading her vulva as an invitation to enter her transformative womb and cave through to the world beyond. The Cathedral of San Vicente in Avila adds a clearly identifiable mushroom between the two uh, hemispheres of the lower uh, part over the door. Uh, to the total mushroom resign, the whole door resembles a mushroom, which is traditional, the traditional entrance to the Christian narthex. The narthex was wielded by the ecstatic Bacchans, 
the maddened women or mind nets possessed by the god Bacchus. And my, how, how many times I say this, it doesn't get through. The mind as we're doing a mimesis of gathering a sacred plant. And that's what the thyrsus indicates quite clearly. It's the box. There are other names for it also, but the box for the gathered magical plant. <clears throat> they were, the Mayanites were possessed by the god Bacchus, whose mountain revels are depicted with a myriad of motifs that encode the simple reality that they are gathering magical wild plants. Thus, at the very center of ancient classical religion, there is clear proof <coughs> of the use of psychoactive plants to access transcendent spiritual powers, including zoomorphism, divine orgasm, and heightened physical abilities, such as, the flight, such as flight, like animals, or astral projection. The narthex was also called a thyrsus. Its symbolism as a drug box <coughs> can be sensed in, <coughs> in the use of the word as the ordinary culinary designation for the stipe or trunk stem of a mushroom with its cap, in the case of the Amanita muscaria, the part that is psychoactive, st <coughs> stuffed into its stem. The longevity of this metaphor, the, the cookbook is almost a thousand years after classical Greek culture, and it's common word for the stem of a mushroom. The god of the Mynads was also called Dionysus, whose resident spirit was found in the drink of wine, a mixture of the alcoholic product from the fermentation of the grape, fortified by a variable admixture of natural botanical intoxicants. The cultivated wine and its manufactured intoxicant were paired with its pre-hybridized wild manifestation was seen in the naturally intoxicating ivy. Greek wine was always a drugged potion. Refusing to accept this gift of the god resulted in recidivism or destruction of the city. Whereas acceptance was at the heart of democracy as a form of government uniting classes and empowering the lower orders. And in the case of Athens, the controlled and beneficial hallucinatory reality enacted in their god's theater was largely the reason for the city's emergence as a cultural icon of its own in, in, in ensuing times. It was drugs that created the fifth century BCE classical age of Pericles. And as you see, I'm quoting David Hillman, who is a very intelligent man <laughs> for uh, saying these things. <laughs> these theatrical performances were symbolically inspired emanations from the sacred cave at the base of the Acropolis above the theater. This has not been noted before that there's actually a cave, and it's not, ha it's, it's not by chance that the theater spreads out below the cave. It's an emanation from the cave. It's an enactment of the Paleolithic cave experience. There was apparently, there you see the cave again. There was apparently a true tradition that the great tragic writer Euripides created his dramas in a cave of his own on the island of Sam Salamis, where his family had estates. The cave is deep. And damp with several chambers in use since Neolithic times as a ritual sanctuary. It is a totally inappropriate environment for anything other than mystical rapture. He didn't have a study down there. He was having an entranced experience, probably induced by psychoactive substances. The cave experience was also ritualized as the great mystery religion enacted at the sanctuary of the mother goddess at the village of Eleusis or Elepsina, 
outside Athens, where each year thousands of initiates accessed transcendence via a sacred potion containing a natural occurring form of LSD. And they journeyed in the spirit to the other world to ratify a covenant linking them with deities as reciprocal friends and visitors from foreign realms. The cave at Elipsina. Uh, it was the overwhelming event of a lifetime something experienced by most of the figures now idolized as the great minds of antiquity, both Greek and Roman. The cave experience of antiquity is best preserved in Plato's allegory of the cave. He didn't make this up. It's a tradition going back to the Paleolithic. The cave were the prisoners forced to view only the shadows projected on the rock wall by an underground fire behind them are induced to turn and face the flames and then ascend to the solar brilliance of the outside world. This is only an allegory. Its application is to realize that this ordinary world perceived outside is merely a foretaste of the true reality that lies in the Empyrean beyond. The Platonic cave as magical space <coughs> to access the planet cave as magical enclosure to access and even rearrange the cosmos, what you do down here can change the cosmos, lies at the basis of liturgical space in the sacred architecture of medieval and Renaissance Europe. You can trace the manipulation of the symbolism and construction of cathedrals as part of the same tradition. The ancient peoples had a variety a wide array of psychoactive substances from which to choose. Often mushrooms are only the easiest to identify because of their distinctive shape. On the right, you see St. Christopher carrying the Christ child as he turns into a mushroom. The role of cannabis is which is our topic. <laughs> the role of cannabis is best documented in the holy anointing chrism and sacred incense of Judaism as prescribed in Exodus of the Old Testament. It contains a huge quantity of a so-called fragrant herb, uh, 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 a so-called fragrant cane designated as cannabosum. This has been correctly identified now for almost a century as the assimilation into Hebrew of the Scythian plant that in Greek is rendered as cannabis. The high priest, I love these fancified redrawings of the holy moment, the high priest each year on Yom Kippur, this is no longer done because the temple doesn't exist, but on Yom Kippur, he entered the confined, enclosed space of the inner tabernacle of the temple in Jerusalem with a burning brazier of the aromatic incense. And there, Yahweh materialized to him amidst the smoke upon the altar of the Ark of the Covenant. As the personification of Israel, the high priest offered himself as bride to the deity, reaffirming the covenant. This is, of course, radical patriarchal revisionism of a worship of the goddess. Now the priest, a man, dresses as a woman and is going to and impersonate the, the nation and marry Yahweh. The original Ark of the Covenant underwent considerable alteration since the time of Moses and the Israelites wandering in the desert. Once it had two angels atop it copulating. <laughs> The ark in the temple in Jerusalem was a pious forgery, and the angels had been separated by a decent interval. But to mask the embarrassment about the mere existence of a graven image, the Jewish Neoplatonist Philo significantly claimed that there was so much smoke inside the tabernacle that the, piece, the priest couldn't see anything anyway, so who knows what they were copulating. There is no way that the concentrated fumigation with cannabis incense would not have been a psychoactive agent to access the materialized vision of the deity. 
Cannabis was probably always an ingredient in the incenses that fumigated sacred space in classical Greek and Roman sanctuaries. It was also commonly available as an, as an additive to wine. Strangely, however, cannabis didn't make its first appearance in the classical pharmacopoeia until the first century common era in the medical encyclopedia of Dioscorides. And unlike entries for other psychoactive plants like mandrake, opium, and datura, it does not have a variety of magical other names suggestive of its involvement in myth and religion. It is simply also listed as sclenostrophon, a reed twine, for its common use in manufacturing ship cables in Asterian, or starry, for the pattern of its leaves. It should have some mythical involvement. Botanists, however, were not empirical scientists, but uncritical polymaths, and they merely copied from each other, perpetuating a variety of confused attributes. They weren't supposed to judge. They were passing on the tradition. Thus, cannabis has an evil smell, which is not true. And it was used to treat a variety of symptoms from impotence, perhaps, to flatulence, I don't know, and earaches, especially worms in the ear. Nor did they know correctly what parts of the plant are chemically active. It is not until the second century that a confused notice about the plant's intoxicating properties entered the medical writings. Since Herodotus announced its existence as a powerful drug like wine in the fifth century BCE, it is highly unlikely that cannabis played no role in Greek culture of the classical period or even before. As with cannabis today, however, there would have been numerous popular names for it beyond the Scythian designation. You can call it almost anything, and it, it comes out right. The principle of <laughs> the principal religious ritual in ancient Greek was the making of smoke. Hence, one such name is probably the smoke plant, Thimbra. Its etymology indicates it comes from the burning, producing smoke, which unfortunately is identified as a kind of savory or thyme. Saturia thumbra, how disappointing. No, it is named for the satyr, the ithophallic goat manifestation of the god Bacchus in the mountain revels of the Mynads. The satyrs materialized as sexual agents for the, uh, for the god, convorting sexually with the women in what can only be understood as a cosmogonic mystical or orgasm, since goat men do not exist except in a parallel dimension, such as the one the women accessed in the ritual gathering of the intoxicating plants that embodied the deity's spirit. It is, in this regard, it is interesting that among the items of misinformation recorded about cannabis is that it grows in the depths of forests Satyriasis is the medical designation for an inordinate male lusting. Such an association with the ecstatic metaphor complex indicates that the common identification is probably erroneous. Linnaeus, in his exercise of devising a universal scientific nomenclature, often merely distributed available ancient names without regard to the correct identity. Thumbra is also associated with the god Apollo, probably as the traditional opposition with Dionysus. Apollo had the surname, the nickname of Thumbrius, supposedly derived from the assumption that there was a place never identified, there is no such place, near Troy where he had a temple. Or maybe there was a neighboring hill of the same name. 
This is analogous. This is <coughs> analogous to the naming of Hempstead in Norfolk for its weedy crop. I have to say in Norfolk, because not all Hempsteads are derived from hemp. Um, One of the sons of the Trojan priest Laakuan bore the name Thumbros. In the famous Dolon and Odysseus episode of the Iliad, the Thumbra plant figures in the ruse of lycanthropy, turning into a wolf. This is significant because the Homeric poems written down in the eighth century, so we've gone back now several centuries from the classical period, and their traditional material. So it goes back to whenever the story was first told, and that probably goes back to the first shaman's experience in the sacred cave. <clears throat> the mother of the god Apollo was supposedly shown the island of Delos for the birthing of Apollo by a pack of wolves from his southern Anatolian homeland. That homeland was Lycia, named for the totemic wolf, which figures in the iconography of its coinage. Significantly, the person who eats Thumbra experiences altered vision. In Aristophanes' Acarnian's comedy, the poor farmer imitates a sacred procession for a private celebration of a rural festival. This means it was commonly known uh, to the rural population and involved in their uh, rituals in the fifth century. He instructs his daughter to carry her basket, seeing with the sight of a thumbra eater, which apparently means in a state of vision ac accessed by the herb. Happy the man who marries you, the father declares. It makes you Fart like a pussy in the morning. Watch out for the crowd so that no one sneaks up and nibbles off your jewels. It is unlikely that a poor farmer's daughter has anything but metaphoric jewels. The scene is expectedly obscene. The slave Xanthius is told to follow behind. It's your job to keep it up behind the basket bearer, he is told. Since this is comedy, the phallus is still attached to the actor as his stage costume. The basket has obvious sexual metaphors. It appears that Xanthius has his upright phallus behind the unfortunate girl, wiggling her so-called sacred basket. Such baskets held holy objects in the form of replicas of the sexual organs. The whole import of the episode is the celebration of a Dionysian experience, which is to say, an ecstatic orgy. The sexual and sight-altering connotations of the Thumbra plant as evidenced in the Aristophanic episode, as well as its association with satyriasis and Apolline lycanthropy are clear indications that the plant is not Linnaeus's savory time, but savory is the way they translate satyr, savory time, but something psychoactive and fuming or smoky and capable of accessing shamanic animal <laughs> transmogrification. Few plants are generally aphrodisiacs in actually stimulating the genitalia but generally the euphoria of the trance state as orgasmic, has, has orga orgasmic similarities, especially in the experience of imperial transport or chthonic oneness with the realm of Gaia. Thus, it was an ongoing routine joke in Aristophanes that Euripides' mother was a vegetable seller implying that she was an herbalist peddling her sexual remedies through the streets, although the family was landed in hardly lower class. She was a witch. The most obvious ancient name for cannabis probably was simply smoke, kapnos. The smoke walkers, or kapnobatai, were shamans 
who accessed their trans state, <laughs> trans state by fumigation, most probably with cannabis fumes. As smoke, it lurks in the famous parody of Socrates in Aristophanes' Clouds comedy, 423 BCE. More explicitly, clouds of smoke. It's specified. The philosopher was introduced on stage, hanging high in a basket so that he can access his high thoughts as he summons his clouds of smoke beneath him. If he were not high, he could never have had his philosophical ideas. The old man Strepsiades has enlisted himself for the education in the school of Socrates in order to find a way out of paying for the debts that his spendthrift son has run up. He declares himself ready for his initiation. He has fasted and needed only thimbra as a, studied, a steady diet of smoke plant. Diet of smoke plant. Just before Socrates came swinging in high in his basket, his students were parodied as burning coals in his think shop. This is in the likeness of the Scythian cannabis fumigation tents as they searched for the secrets of the mysteries. Herodotus had described this ritual in his history, which was current knowledge at the time of the Clouds comedy, with the historian just recently deceased Herodotus had probably given public readings of his history in Athens. We have to remember that people didn't read. They could read, but there weren't any books, and reading was tedious. It was public performance, and Herodotus is known to have performed his history in Athens. He describes the Scythian cult of the dead, in which the men set up small teepee-like tents and creep inside, tossing cannabis onto red-hot coals in a brazier to produce a highly intoxicating fumigation that transported them to a state of ecstasy. Archaeological remains, as you have seen, have confirmed the existence of such funeral ritual among the Scythians. The description fits perfectly the parody of Socrates' think shop. Inside the frontisterian, of so-called wise souls, our students, who claim that the universe is like a covered incense burner, burner or so-called choker, and we men are like the burning coals, punning on the word for men, anthropoi, and coals, anthrakes. These students are further parried as Spartan sympathizers aping their teacher Socrates, who customarily went around unwashed and barefoot in the manner of the liminal period of indoctrination in which Spartan, <coughs> in, in which Spartan adolescent men were driven into the wilderness to fend for themselves, stealing their food like outlaws and living like wolves. In fact, when the old man first sees them, he blatantly thinks they are just the emaciated, starving Spartan elite soldiers who had just the year before been barricaded on the tiny island off Pylos and were now currently being held hostage, captive as hostages in Athens. Thus, Aristophanes parodies the high science of Socratic mathematics, measuring the leap of the body louse from Chirophon, filthy, hippie, the disciple, to his master Socrates in the newly minted metric louse foot, a distance that set a new Olympic record. The implication is obviously that all the students are infested with lice. The students are further parodied as delving into mysteries the secrets of religious initiations, which involve psychoactive potions forbidden from profane use. Thus, as Socrates swings in overhead in his basket, they are all bent over with their asses to the cosmos, digging for medicinal roots. That's astronomy, <laughs> explains the student, to which the old Strepsiades replies, because they're digging into the ground, if it's bulbs you're looking for, I've got a couple of big ones right here. 
Socrates summons in the chorus of clouds. They are the patrons of shamans, druggies, hippies, ecstatic dancers, song twisters, astrologer quacks. The old Strepsiades thought they were, well, just smoke. <laughs> One of the earliest playwrights, in fact, had the nickname of Smokey, supposedly because his poetry was so dense, but more probably because he, like the others, got his inspiration from fumigation. From, from fumigation. Only two verses of a play, supposedly a tragedy, are preserved, in which he discusses the edibility of pig's feet, dense material. When the old man finally sees the clouds, because they can take whatever form uh, they want, uh, like hallucinations, there is one aspect of their appearance that puzzles him. They don't look like maidens, not at all, because they have noses. There is a plethora of metaphors for the penis in every language. The nose is how the obligatory phallus of their comic costume has been identified. With their noses embedded in their own fumes, they are constantly inhaling their ethereal psychoactive essence. Otherwise, they'd never get high. <laughs> These are the only gods you need, proclaims Socrates as the old man declares himself ready for the lesson, the blessed trinity. <clears throat> With his so-called soul hardened, he's going into the think shop of souls, wise souls, his so-called soul hardened in ironclad by the diet of the smoke plant Thumbra, ready to plunge it into the mysteries of education. Yes, the soul is another. The metaphors, this there's this here asshole. That's your chaos, explains the teacher, demonstrating I'm one of the actors. Uh, and then there's that there tongue that's babbling between the legs. That's your clouds for you. The audience would easily have recognized Socrates as a smoke walker, a capnobates, or a smoke diviner, a capnomantes, or a smoke seer, Capno Alges. The clouds ends with the old man turning the tables on Socrates. Hey you, what are you doing up on the roof? shouts Socrates. I'm walking on air and contemplating the sun, replies the old man. I'm going to choke, cries Socrates, using the same image of the choker or pnigels for the think shop as Strepsiades sets their fire. The Scythians, with their smoke ritual, we like to think they were far away, but they're not, they weren't, but in particular, uh, they were actually a, a familiar feature in Athens of the classical period. They were hired as mercenaries to supply the police force. The Spartan implications probably indicate that the Athenians suspected or knew that the soldiers cemented their allegiance to their Apollo wolf god and to their warrior fraternity with a cannabis ritual. Similar rituals are documented for the Nordic berserkers that turned into bears or wolves, became berserk, and had some kind of psychoactive sacrament, probably a Amanita muscaria. In the case, my final picture, in the case of the warrior brotherhood of Mithras were back in the cave. The members who included the elite of the Roman Empire, most of its emperors, soldiers, and male bureaucrats perpetuated the cave experience traceable back to the Paleolithic age and experienced transcendence to the realm of the Empyrean through a sevenfold stage of entheon-induced initiations, the chamber was always fumigated with incense, in addition to the other psychoactive sacraments. Mithraism was the way that the Zoroastrian Hauma Soma cult was assimilated 
in the civilizing traditions of Europe. Okay, we're done on time. Just want to remind everybody, if they have questions, use the mic. <laughs> I touched briefly on a number of things, any one of which, of course, um, would take um, a long time to explain. But it summarizes material that I have presented in other works. And so um, I can talk about any of these things that you want. Where did you get the picture of the Scythian policeman? <laughs> I looked up uh, uh, Scythian policeman Athens, and there it was. <laughs> I love Google. Yeah. The, um, the strange thing is that um, there, there was so little apparent mention of cannabis in classical Greek culture, and that is simply because they were not accustomed to the term cannabis, just as we don't use we're using cannabis here because this is a conference, but most of us don't call it that. And maybe we're beginning to call it that now. But even the law that restricted its use referred to it as marijuana. I mean, how sloppy to refer to the plant not by its Linnaeus name. Um, you were talking at the beginning about uh, the word box, and, and you were talking about Vortex, it. yeah. Well, along with uh, talking about Bacchus, I thought, is there an etymological? No, no. no uh, Bacchus, Bacchus is the name that we don't know the etymology of. Um, it belongs to the pre-Greek language, but it apparently in the pre-Greek language means a sprig of a plant. Right. I, I, so he represents the wild nature of the god, whereas Dionysus has an Indo-European et etymology, and it's the way he becomes assimilated. The two exist at the same time, but Dionysus is the civilized manifestation and Bacchus is the wild one. It, it got me thinking, so I uh, googled the etymology of the word box and it does say a shrub there, so maybe there's a uh, but that's way back. That's because there is a, there is a uh, shrub called boxwood. It may not have anything to do with Fair enough. it. Okay. I'd, I'd just like to I mean, I'd love it if it were, but I think it's yeah. the boxwood shrub. Probably right. I, I just want to invite everybody here to come check out the Herb Museum for free. Just mention that you're a part of the Cannabis Roots um, Conference and uh, we'll give you free access to the museum too. And any other questions or to anyone else who spoke? Yeah. Oh, okay, use the mic, so come on up, and uh, I'll just ask my question first since I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, so what kind of reaction have you received uh, from your, about your research into drugs and religion, the cannabosum, uh, academically, and uh, in the wider world? Yeah, good question. I've outlived my enemies, <laughs> and the tide is changing. The very same thing that I was not supposed to mention, I was solicited by my chairman to propose a course. I said, well, we'll call it something else. And he said, no, no, call it Antheogens and Human Consciousness. And so it went before the committee, which uh, quibbled about everything, whether it was going to be accepted as a university course. And it was accepted. And so now they want me to teach that. <laughs> and and the, the, the fact that classical scholars ignored the work on the Thyrsus and the Narthex and the Monadic ritual has turned around too because there are new scholars now in Greece, uh, northern Greece in particular, in Bulgaria, and we're organizing conferences and they are indeed saying, yes, there were mushrooms, there was cannabis, uh, it was an ecstatic religion, and it goes way back. <coughs> Thanks. Have you ever had an opportunity to find a society that would, with the exception of alcohol, pick one particular entheogen and label it as forbidden or taboo while allowing others? Or is it universally accepted that most entheogens would be used, whether it be controlled by the shaman or you know, restricted from general access, but they wouldn't uh, clearly label one as forbidden and not usable or yeah, belittle it or prohibit it? Very good question, and, and there is 
an extraordinary example that that was the case. In, in the instance of the Eleusinian mystery, there was a special sacred drug which was so superior to other things available that people risked their life. It was against the law. You lost your life if you were caught doing this. It was against the law to use it in a profane uh, circumstance. So it must have been a superior intoxicant of some kind. As, as you know, we think it was ergot LSD. And so, yes, you couldn't use that. Um, and probably there are other instances also where it was inappropriate. We know um, that uh, it was also, some of them were associated with proper behavior for certain ages. And so henbane is psychoactive. But there's a um, mention in, in one of the comedies saying, look at you, as old as you are, and you're still doing henbane. So you should do that when you're young. So there's this thing called the Oracle of Trophonius. Oh, yes. And if you could just talk, if you could just tell us a little bit more about the Oracle of Trophonius. You mentioned, and the reason I bring it up is you mentioned caves and the oddity yeah. of having the oracular experience. This one has always blown my mind yeah, because I, I, it was the one oracle yeah. that you didn't want to do. Yeah, I know. They it actually terrifying. had a saying of, it looks like he's, he's come out of the cave of Trophonius, yeah. meaning they were shell-shocked. Yeah. Yeah. They wandered around for days, depressed and crying. And yeah, I, all of this from this oracle. Tell I, them about the, the okay, cave. Okay, okay. I, I, you have I, I shared with you the work in progress, but not the part added just recently, which is, is about the cave of Trophonius. And this was a earth oracle uh, on the road to, to Delphi. The um, a, a person who consulted the oracle um, had to live in the woods for a period, wash in the cold water of the stream, and then go to a chasm um, above the town uh, on your way to Delphi today, and um, sit on a rock and dangle his feet in, and then apparent into the chasm. And then apparently he was pulled down, and he had an experience so terrifying that he was uh, disoriented for a long period. Sometimes found wandering miles away before he came back again. With, with regard to the intensity of these uh, trance states, with uh, the Mynads, um, uh, it's only on occasion that we get anecdotes that let us know what's going on. And I want to emphasize that we don't know what the Mynads were doing, except that satyrs don't exist, OK? So they were having, uh, they were having some kind of uh, experience that involved creatures from another realm. But on uh, one occasion, uh, they were caught in a snowstorm. It was only women. And they had to send men up to uh, bring them down from the mountain. They were just clothed, as you saw them in the vase paintings, in a, in a goat skin or, or a fawn skin. And on another occasion, um, they came down from the mountain and were so disoriented that they wandered into Amphasa, which is a neighboring town unaware of the fact that the town was at war and the place had, was a garrison for soldiers. And the people of the town, the women of the town, formed a protective circle around them because they were afraid the soldiers would rape them. And then the women passed out <coughs> until the morning. Um, this does not mean that they took drugs on the mountain. They were, it, it's quite po these are proper women. Um, uh, who are de uh, in, in fifth century society, uh, especially in Athens, were denied uh, a role of equality with, with men. And yet they did this. And it may be simply that getting together again with the women and performing the rituals was enough to access this intense experience. But it was intense. And it was not involved, by the involved with the drinking of wine, because we don't ever see them carting up wine to the mountain. It would be inconvenient. Why would you want to do that anyway? If they got high on anything, it was high in some plant they picked on the mountain. But it may be just symbolically that they are picking the plant, because there are many metaphors for the plant. So if you try to <laughs> apply the lens of reality what's going, you might as well be uh, honest about it. These are metaphors. They supposedly pulled bulls to pieces with their bare hands. Now, women cannot do that. Nor can men. Bulls don't like that happening. Uh, 
that's the most extreme. Uh, they held fire in their hands. Well, in the trance state, you can access paranormal abilities, but then the fire could be the fire of the plant, as I showed you with Prometheus uh, fondling his genitals. <laughs> um, they, uh, those are the most extreme things that couldn't possibly happen. Um, they gave nurse to wild animals. They'd have to catch them. Where did they get them? Sometimes it was wolves. Um, even a baby wolf is apt to bite the nipple. And where did they get them? Okay, so it, it, it can't be that. Um, they went and, and caught rabbits with their bare hands. No traps or anything like that. How did they learn to do that sort of thing? The bunny is the equivalent of the pussy, and we see them displaying their bunny catch to the god. That doesn't mean to say that they were having sex, because these are proper women. They're not having real, real sex. They were having metaphysical sex, which is more orgasmic, and especially for women who were denied an awareness, ordinarily, of their sexuality, who were married at puberty to a man um, 20 years perhaps older uh, than she was, it was inappropriate for them even to know about an orgasm. And yet, you uh, the, th the thing that's amazing about classical mythology and culture, you, you always balance one thing with the other. All right, so they're completely repressed, but on the other hand, we have to let them do this. And if you don't let them do that, you have the outcome of saying no to, dra uh, to drugs. Not that saying yes to drugs is a, a solution once you've said no to drugs because you've made the enemy so much stronger, but that answer is wrong. You end up like Thebes being destroyed. Anything else? Not even about Mithraism. <laughs> I mean, I passed over that very quickly, but these it suppose, suppose they went into these caves to have, to have a banquet. They're small, about half the size of this room, and about uh, accommodate 30 people in a very small space. We know some of the nasty things that they did as part of the rituals, but in addition to that, what they experienced was bursting through the cosmos. They prepared for this by drugs and by rituals, um, amongst the, the rituals at the beginning, the initiate, as still happens in secret societies, was humiliated by hazing. It was for men only. He was stripped naked. We see this in frescoes. Or he was dressed as a woman in front of the other men. And he was married to the man who was at the height of the hierarchy, the father. Um, this appears to be ritualized sodomy. Uh, and uh, as in all hazing incidents, something so embarrassing happens that you now r feel closer to the other guys. <laughs> if I may just add one other thing, I mean, we do, we do try to you know, legislate an awful lot, and I don't think hazing rituals that have now been uncovered in colleges and, and so forth um, are correct. When we know that I mean, it, it gets into the news and we have to have an investigation and, and the, the college is going to have to forbid that they do things like that. Well, I don't think it's right to do it, but maybe it's wrong to say you can't do it. Um, this is often a bit of a side tangent, but in your studies, uh, have you come across any evidence of what we know of or call now the, the Freemasons uh, oh, yes. using uh, ethnogenic drugs in, in their ceremonies? Freemasonry is a continuation of Mithraism, and it uses much of the same uh, metaphoric structure, and uh, the, the business of being stripped naked uh, is, is now symbol symbolically done with the initiate having significant tears in his clothing experience exposing just in particular areas of, uh, of the body underneath, but it's a pacified version of being stripped naked. Um, and um, it's interpreted in, in a highly metaphoric way, and so the initiates uh, learn how to construct. Originally, they were supposed to reconstruct the temple in Jerusalem, 
and um, that's why they're masons. Um, and there were actual masons, a guild of masons who built things, but those are called operative masons, and the society is a, a society of, of um, symbolic masons. They're building the temple of their soul. And it, we all uh, know uh, relatives who are Freemasons, and it's a, a fine, <laughs> um, beneficent organization. But we also have informants that tell us that there are there is an elite within the elite group who knows things that the others don't know, and in that elite group, there's a psychoactive sacrament. Would that be mentioned by Magnus Incognito anywhere in his works? Uh, I don't know. Anything else? You've got me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, um, great presentation, and uh, thanks for everybody for coming to Cannabis Roots, and uh, thank you to our international audience out there in the interwebs. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Make way for the entheogenic revolution. <laughs>